Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another rendition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We're excited to have you back here and wrap up the day with us. We've got Joe Edelman here. Joe, what's happening? How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Scott, and it is an honor to be here and finally get to talk to you. Hey, you know, it's an honor for us to have you here and be able to Thank talk you. with us. We're super excited about it. In case anybody is wondering and forgets who's talking in front of you, Joe's got his name right there on his shirt, so you can't forget him. You he wanted, he right. wanted to eliminate all those issues from the get-go. So uh, Joe's going to be talking about the art of creative portraiture. This is a two-part series. So part one will take place, obviously, today, and we'll have part two later on. You can always check out the b &H event space page to see part two and register for that. So make sure you're coming back and partaking in that. If you have any questions for Joe, anything that you want to get answered, if you're joining us on Zoom, use the Q&A tab. If you're joining us from a live stream or Facebook, you can, as always, use the comment section. Like I told you, Joe, in the green room, I know you got a lot planned and I don't want to take up any more of your time. So I'm going to hand over the mic to you. Thanks for being awesome. here and I'll see you in a little bit. Scott, thank you so much. It is my pleasure. So welcome, gang. And before I get started, I do want to take a moment and thank all of you that are here live or even if you're watching the replay, thank you for being a photographer and for your desire to be creative. Honestly, I think we need more creativity in the world. And I do also want to thank B&H for both their real in-person and their virtual event space. We really are very fortunate as photographers that there are companies like B&H that understand the value of education and who are willing to support it. So, if you have seen me speak before, or if you follow me on YouTube, you know that my mission is to help photographers develop a better understanding of the hows and whys behind making consistently great photographs. This afternoon, my goal is to share with you the creative process that I use to make creative portraits. Now, sometimes they're referred to as fashion portraits. Sometimes they're called beauty portraits. But my goal is always to create something that is not a normal or shall we say traditional portrait. So today we're going to focus on the ideas, where they come from, finding the subjects and the planning and the preparation that goes into making these photographs. When we reconvene for part two on October 28th, we'll get into the shoot and we'll talk about lighting, lenses, camera angles, and the overall execution of the shoot. So what I really hope to do is to inspire you to go out and create and to step outside your box to be able to take your work to the next level. So sit back and relax. There are some really important things that we need to discuss before we can actually pick up a camera and make these creative portraits. So first up, let's deal with the obvious question. What makes a portrait creative? So the best part about this, there are no rules. I hate rules in photography. I mean, certainly we, we can't debate the rules of physics, right? But all the other rules are just creativity killers that honestly lead to boring and rather predictable images. So my creative portraits, they're not really about the person. Creativity is the subject in these portraits. And, and it can range all across the board. Creative portraits, they're fun. And in this case, done with a $2 pair of sunglasses from Amazon, a cosplay wig, and some blue plastic balls that were composited in Photoshop afterwards. Creative portraits may be all about the makeup artists. In this case, all I did was to add some sheer black material with glitter in it. When it comes to creative portraits, keep in mind, glitter is your friend. Creative portraits are also vivid. Bright, bold colors, and in this case, some creative mosaic type makeup, and a $1 roll of yellow cellophane from a dollar store. Creative portraits for me are also glossy, and this is a one light shot with a small piece of black vinyl wrapped around the model's head and shaped into an avant-garde styled hat and then a small piece of black material wrapped around her neck to make the choker. And I want you to notice as we go through a lot of these pictures today that I do a lot of my shots with the model wearing just a tube top so that I have bare shoulders like you see in this picture. 
But then I'll frequently take material, random bits of material, to create tops and cover the shoulders. And that way the outfits don't look store bought. And that way they also don't date the photo. These types of portraits, they're fresh. Even though my photos aren't about the person, I do want all the attention to be on the person in the picture. I do lots of pictures with direct eye contact. So soft expressions, great skin, elegant hands, and hair that isn't messy, unless I want it messy. Those are all very important elements to my creative portraits. Creative portraits are also often flawless. In this case, just a, a faux fur wrap was draped across the front of the model and some shiny material was wrapped around her head to create a unique headpiece. Creative portraits, hopefully, are going to be head turning. This shot was created on a stage at WPPI two years ago using the live composite feature in an Olympus camera. The background was painted in real time using a Savage RGB Pro light wand at a trade show with the lights on. You know, sometimes these portraits are not what they appear to be. This is actually a composite where a stock image of the colored texture is blended onto the model's face in post-production. Creative portraits can be made by doing things that we're often taught not to do. The bokeh that you see in this shot it's actually water. I sprayed it onto the camera lens and then aimed the speed light with a blue gel back into the lens from about a foot away. By stopping the lens down to F16, I was able to turn the water drops into bokeh balls. You might have caught that I said a blue gel. Simple hue adjustment in post-production was able to turn that blue purple. So. The cool part about this is creative portraits, they're whatever you want them to be because they're about your creativity. Even better yet, they are the result of creative collaboration. Hopefully with a makeup artist or a hairstylist and maybe even a clothing stylist. And they certainly require collaboration from your subject because the subject's got to bring it to life. So the selection of the right idea and the right subject is very important. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so now that you have a better idea of what I mean by creative portrait, and you've seen a few examples, let's begin to walk through the process of making one of these shots happen. And this is where the real work begins. In these creative portraits, things like, whoops, excuse me, things like the subject, wardrobe, makeup, setting, lighting, props, camera angles, posture, expressions, post-production, all of these things need to be coordinated carefully. In my case, my priority is to emphasize the beauty of my subject. Now, please notice in that list, I didn't mention pose. Instead, I listed posture and body language. It's because pose is a four-letter word. Remember what your mama taught you don't use four letter words. For me, the finished image needs to evoke an emotional response from the viewer. The favorite response that I can ever get when somebody looks at one of my pictures is simply, wow. What I want to happen is I want the image to make a connection. My goal is that the image will cause the viewer to pause and examine it so that they experience a connection with the subject. Because remember, as a photographer, when you create an image, you have that experience of the creative process, of making the creative decisions, of setting things up, of interacting with that subject. No other human being, especially not when they view the finished image, is going to have the same experience with that image as you did. So for me, I want to find a way that I am going to force the viewer to connect with that subject so they at least feel like they are having an experience with that subject. So where do we begin with all this? Everything that we are going to discuss today, as well as on the 28th, 
we can fit it into two categories, psychology or photography technique, either of those two. Well, one thing that's been very clear to me since honestly the early days of my career, the work that I do while photographing people and doesn't matter whether it was photojournalism in the early days of my career or weddings or commercial advertising or these creative portraits, 80% of the process while photographing people is psychology. 20% of it is photography. Now the photography part, of course, that's the camera, the lens, the settings, the lighting, all the technical stuff. That's actually the easy part. It is very important to me that the technical side comes instinctively so that I don't have to think too much about it when I've got a human subject in front of my camera. And believe me, gang, that requires practice. I need to interact with my subject. I need to keep them engaged. I don't want to be head down on my gear, fumbling with settings and trying to figure out how to get the camera to do something. And by the way, that advice, that applies strongly even for like regular portraits. The 80% that is psychology, that's where the real work is. That involves everything from the creative spark, you know, the idea for the shot, to finding the right subject and preparing that subject and collaborating to create an image that meets or exceeds your creative vision. But it's that creative vision that seems to stump a lot of people, you know, I'm routinely asked, where do the ideas come from? The short answer, drugs. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Honestly, not drugs. I've never done drugs. Photography, that's my drug. The ideas, honestly, they're, they're all around you all day, all night, all the time. The challenge is for you to find them. And there are lots of ways to find them. And just like any other creative inspiration, you first have to be open to things that are different and unusual and not the norm. So for me, ideas, they can come from looking at the color combinations of a fall leaf that's laying on the road or the color schemes used in an interesting television show or movie. Like, you know, this past summer, the Queen's Gambit had just incredible color palettes to it. You may have noticed that I'm big on color. I like bright, bold colors, and I love combinations that aren't used very often. Now, a great way to help yourself come up with these new ideas is to use a technique called divergent thinking. Believe me, it's worth Googling this term to learn more about it. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about it today because we could literally spend hours on it. Simply put, Divergent thinking is kind of a way of connecting dots to find creative ideas in unexpected places. And you can develop your creative skills with divergent thinking. One example would be walking into a room, taking a look around the room, and picking two random objects like um, a water bottle and an iPhone. And then saying to yourself, how can I turn these into an interesting image? So in my case, I found a blue image that I was able to put on my iPhone screen, held the water bottle over top, and with a macro lens, shot through the water bottle to create a piece of abstract art. But we're here to talk about people pictures and creative portraits. So it could be something like working in the studio and deciding to show your lighting modifier reflected in the pair of sunglasses. It might be realizing that you could use an inexpensive 65 inch television as a portrait background and create essentially any kind of background from real locations to abstracts to the ever popular bokeh balls. So look, the bottom line is ideas are everywhere if you're willing to look for them and put in some effort to experiment. At this point in my career, I find it harder to come up with ideas that I've never done before or that I haven't seen somewhere else. I've been shooting for a long time. So 
I find that, you know, I don't have a hard time with the process of finding new ideas, but what I struggle with, I have a hard time with the idea of been there, done that. So my solution is to embrace failure. Literally, I intentionally explore ideas that my experience tells me will fail or won't work well, kind of like spraying the water onto the camera lens. And then I work to solve problems in a unique and a different way, in a way that I've never done before. In the process, <laughs> there will always be lots of failure, but I'm okay with that. In fact, I use that failure as fuel. I use it to push me towards a unique and a creative result. So now in the course of doing all of this, there are times when I find my subject first. And that's where the idea starts. And then I'll build a picture idea around the subject. Now, in my case, usually it actually begins with an idea first and then the subject. But when the subject does come first, it's usually going to be because of something about the subject that inspires me or sparks a concept for the shot. I mean, it could be eyes, lips, hair, or honestly, any combination of things, including that person's personality. For my creative portraits, it could be because a particular subject has access to some very cool outfits or costumes, or maybe because even they have unusually short or some kind of really interesting hairstyle. So if you do struggle with finding concepts, that means it's time for us to do some research and maybe a little studying, depending on what you're thinking you'd like to do. So some of the obvious but not so obvious choices start out with a website like Pinterest. Pinterest is a great resource just by searching for creative portraits or fashion portraits or beauty portraits, you will find tons of potential ideas. Hashtag searches for the same terms, creative portrait, fashion portrait, beauty portrait on sites like Instagram will give you thousands of potential ideas. But please, now that I've encouraged you to do that, please don't be a zombie photographer and do what everybody else does. When you find a photo that you like, the goal is not to copy it. I mean, look, by all means, copy it to prove to yourself that you can do it. In other words, copy it for the purpose of learning. But understand, once you've copied it, don't post that on social media or put it in your portfolio. A copy is never as good as the original. Once you've copied it, your task is to make it your own. Improve it, change it, tweak it. Bottom line, add something to it to make it original. My phone is full of snapshots and screen captures of images that I see. And I may think to myself, oh, you know, I love that color combination. Or gosh, I would have never thought to put those two colors together, or I love that pose or that hairstyle. And then I'll use those photos as a catalyst to build my own concept and my own image. And part of the key to making this work, whether you're using Pinterest or Instagram or just saving images that you see along the way, set aside 15 minutes a week, half an hour if you can spare it, and go through these images that you saved, go through the pages that you saved or bookmarked online and see what jumps out at you and grabs you. And there's a few reasons for doing this. One, it can be inspiring. It can be energizing. It can help get you to get off your butt and go pick up the camera and actually use it and take pictures because it can get you excited about an idea. But two, it's really just throwing that information back into your head to kind of see what sticks. Because here's the thing, especially on my phone, I'll go through, and I tend to do this at the end of every week. I'll go through the images on my phone and scroll through. And frequently on any given week, I'll come across images and my response, my gut response when I see them is, why did I save that? 
it's it's not doing anything for me. I don't delete it. There was a time where for some reason it caught my eye and it caught my attention. And in all likelihood, it eventually will come back around and do that when the time is right, when I'm putting things together and it just happens to be the missing element. And it may be a matter of it's going to show me a color scheme that I like, or it's going to give me an idea for a hairstyle to go with something else that I'm putting together. So bottom line, it's about creating a habit. It's not a once and done thing. And it's not something you only do when, gosh, I'm short on ideas and I need an idea. Make it a habit so that it comes naturally. And then you'll find yourself looking for these ideas everywhere. And you'll find yourself seeing the ideas everywhere. So now that we have an idea or a concept, what steps do we take to make this great shot? First and foremost, collaboration. All of my images are the result of collaboration between at least three people. My subject, my makeup artist, and myself. For these kinds of creative portraits, collaboration is crucial. And it can involve potentially working with clothing designers or stylists, especially if you're not willing to try and figure out how to do all these crazy wraps and all that yourself. And let me be really straight with you, gang. This picture is a perfect example. I did not create that headpiece. My makeup artist, who did an amazing job, created that, that hair piece or headpiece. Sometimes I come up with them. Other times, makeup artists will come up with them. Other times... A model has come up with an idea and that's okay. The more collaboration that's happening in my photographs, the more likelihood that I'm going to come up with things that I would not have thought of on my own that are going to improve my image by maybe taking it in a slightly different direction and elevating the quality of it. For me, when I can, I prefer to work with makeup artists who are proficient at doing both makeup and hair. In some cases, you may be working with two stylists, one doing the hair, the other doing the makeup. That's okay. But understand that the most important element of this collaboration, it's communication. So the, the ability to communicate clearly and effectively, honestly, is one of the most powerful tools that you can have as a people photographer. The ability to make a social connection with your collaborators, and I don't mean social media, I mean social talking, communicating, connections with your collaborators and your subjects, honestly, it's a skill that every photographer needs and must continually practice and develop. So even if you feel that you're not good at it, if it's not your strength now, understand that the more you tell yourself that, the more that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Stop telling yourself that and simply try. It's not about being the best communicator. It's not about being perfect at communicating. What does that mean? It's about making the effort, finding ways to get the message across. Okay, so I'm ready to collaborate and I need to assemble my team. I've already decided, you know, obviously I need a subject to photograph, but I've already decided I need a makeup artist, we're going to leave a stylist out of it for the sake of this conversation because I know that a lot of you either won't have access to a stylist or won't have the budget for that. That's cool. So do we begin with the subject? Do we begin with the stylist? Do we begin with the makeup artist? And as I indicated before, there's no rule. It could start with the makeup artist who's approached me with an idea and said, hey, what do you want to shoot this? I think it would be cool. And by the time we find the subject, we may have already worked out a lot of the details of what this, this image is going to involve, right? So at that point, when we're looking for a subject, really what we're doing is we're looking for the right face to fit the idea. Other times, I may have found a subject that something about their personality or the look I wanted to work with, so I'm going to reach out to a makeup artist and I'll let them know what ideas I have for the shot. So for this conversation today, we're going to imagine that we have found the subject first. And the reason why I want to walk through it that way is because sometimes it can be a little bit more challenging when you're dealing with the subject first. So right out of the box, it's important to understand that there is no such thing as a bad subject. There are potential subjects 
who are maybe not as photogenic as others. And there definitely are potential subjects who don't fit the concept that you're working on or the concept that your makeup artist has brought to you. But there's no such thing as a bad subject. And by the way, this applies to portraits in general. It all comes down to how you, as the photographer, select your subject and then prep your subject, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and then communicate with your subject and your stylist and your makeup artist to be able to create and record the concept that you've brought everyone together to collaborate on. So another big question that I routinely get is how do we find this great subject, Joe? Well, a bunch of different ways. Maybe you already know this person or you've met this person, but more than likely you'll find them on the internet. The most common practice that I use is hashtag searches on Instagram. When we're not in the middle of a pandemic, I travel quite a bit to present and teach workshops. So when I'm headed to a city or a town, I'll do a series of hashtag searches for models in that town. So that brings us then to what makes a great subject for me. So assuming that I'm not looking for a specific feature, right? Just in general, first and foremost, for me, it's going to be an interesting face, interesting eyes, great lips. And by the way, this applies for both female and male subjects. Honestly, for me, the less experience in front of the camera, the better. I don't like to work with models who potentially have a lot of bad habits. If I can help it, what I'd rather do is I'd rather work with someone who has no idea what they're doing. That way they're a sponge to new ideas, my ideas. So, and you know, a good face is going to translate into a great image. Once I find faces that I'm interested in, I'll look through their social media to get a sense of their personality. That way I can determine is this person likely to be responsible? Um, also, of course, by looking through their social media, I can confirm that they really are that attractive and they didn't just land on, you know, one amazingly photoshopped image in their feed. So, um, there are websites like onemodelplace.com, modelmayhem.com. And then in Europe, you can find sites like purpleport.com. I will tell you honestly that I try to avoid them if at all possible. And I would encourage you to, um, not find your subjects on those websites if you can help it. I'm sure that some of you may have already tried or you may have already heard other photographers whining about the models that they found from those websites. All I'll say to you is this, the complaints that you hear are true, but the blame is not with the models. The blame is with the photographers. They're actually the ones that are at fault for the bad experience. And we can gladly take that up during the Q and A in the event that I may have just offended someone. Okay. I'll gladly explain that in detail. So once I've got my subject lined up, the last piece of my collaborative team is that makeup artist and or hairstylist and photographers will ask me all the time. Do I really need a makeup artist? The number one reason to work with a makeup artist, never forget this is in case the results are less than outstanding, you have somebody to blame. No, I'm just kidding, seriously. I'm gonna get hate mail from makeup artists for that. Look, if you want great results, you pretty much have to work with a makeup artist. But, you know, don't take my word for it. Just a, a quick set of example, right? Here's a beautiful young model with no makeup as she arrived at my studio. Here's what a makeup artist can do with a face like that. Or this, still the same, face. Now, commonly photographers will tell me, I don't know anything about makeup, but I don't know how to find a makeup artist. So I've created some resources to help you out on my website. I have a directory of makeup artists in all 50 of the United States. Now this is not every single makeup artist. In fact, if you know of a good makeup artist and they're not listed, you should have them submit their work to be included. But the makeup artists that are listed, are folks that I have either worked with personally or whose work I reviewed. 
and I feel that I'd be willing to work with them if the situation were to arise. You can find the directory with this short link. It's joeedelman.fyi slash makeup. Now also to help you out, I've made two different videos that you can find on YouTube. What to know about working with a makeup artist and you need a makeup artist for great portraits, headshots, and model shots. These videos will help you tremendously if you are of the mindset. And again, this is kind of one of those self-fulfilling prophecies. So be careful how many times you tell yourself this. But if you're of the mindset that I don't know what to look for in a makeup artist, I don't know how to tell if a makeup artist is good or bad. I don't know what to tell a makeup artist that I want them to do. I have no idea, Joe. So the honest piece of advice that I have for you is going back to what I said before about not being afraid to fail and about communicating. I promise you, no makeup artist, professional, amateur, or otherwise, is going to show up for your shoot because they want to make bad pictures. It's not going to happen. And indeed, if you just say to them, hey, you're the pro, do your thing, you can pretty much expect that your shoot's going to fall short of its potential because they can't read your mind. So you need to communicate. You need to communicate with ideas, but think about it. If you don't know the right words and you're afraid that you're gonna sound stupid, go back to Pinterest or Instagram or any website and look for ideas. And it may be multiple pictures where you're gonna say, listen, I really like the way the eye makeup is in this picture and the color on these lips is awesome. And you see how they use this contouring around the model's cheeks? to make them darker and to make them more dramatic. Can we do that? You don't have to know all the right words, but I promise you any makeup artist that you work with, even if it's your very first time, will love you if you're making the attempt to give them that kind of guidance. So you can find those two videos on my YouTube channel or also with this short link. If you go to the YouTube channel, here, I'll back up really quick, up at the top of every page, not the search box at the very top, but you'll see a little magnifying glass. Just click on that and type makeup or go to the link, joeedelman.fyi makeup vid, and that'll take you to those videos. The videos go into a lot of detail, so they will help you break down what should you look for in a makeup artist portfolio, how do you communicate with the makeup artist while you're planning and also during the shoot, executing the shoot, right? Okay. So I've got my team, I've got my concept. The next step, planning. And before I dive into planning, I do wanna talk briefly about the incredible importance of paying attention to details. And I'm throwing that in now at the beginning of planning because in every aspect of your planning prior to the shoot and the actual shoot, attention to detail is super, super important. Don't, don't discount it, okay? I'm a firm believer that success in photography, just like in life, it is in the details. These creative portrait images require extreme attention to detail. Flyaway hairs, twisted straps, unflattering shadows. These are all things that can simply ruin a shot. So you have to practice and you have to teach yourself to pay attention to that detail. For me, nothing should ever distract from the beauty of my subject. And believe me, if something looks sloppy in one of my photos, you can bet that it took 20 minutes to get that kind of cool sloppy. So the bottom line, you only get out of a shot what you put in front of the camera. Crap in equals crap out. And please don't be the fix it in post photographer and think that you will generate consistently great images that way. Sometimes that works. It's one of the great benefits that we get from digital photography, but it will let you down just as often as it will save you. Now, in fairness, let me make one other point about that concept. With practice, you can do what I do, and that is when I'm shooting, if I see that something is out of place. Maybe I see that there's a piece of hair on my subject's face. It's not coming through their eyes. It's not intersecting with glasses. It's just falling right under the cheek. Depending on how that shot is going and depending on how close I am 
feeling that I am to getting like the shot that I'm after, I may make a conscious decision to fix it in post because that hair that I'm talking about, I can remove that hair in about three seconds very efficiently as opposed to stopping the momentum of my shoot potentially having the model move when I stop or and having hair fall and then having a bigger mess and then not being able to get back to where I was. So while I'm shooting, I will sometimes make decisions to say, okay, I see that. And that's the important part. I've paid attention to the detail. I see it. So I'm going to continue shooting and I will fix that in post. If it's something that I know is going to be challenging or it's going to take a lot of time, like for instance, if that piece of hair is coming down through an eye, I'm going to stop what I'm doing, I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to make sure that it's coming out of the camera ready to go. Just a little side note, I will say that a great way when you're trying to do these creative portraits and really help yourself learn to see these details in real time while you're shooting, because if you're being honest, all of us have had the experience, I certainly have, where we shot an image and then we download it into the computer and when we bring them up in Lightroom or Bridge or whatever, asset management tool you're looking at, all of a sudden you're seeing details that you didn't notice when you were shooting, right? So one of the best ways to slow yourself down and not only force yourself to pay attention, but help yourself learn to pay attention to the details is to go ahead and shoot tethered. So just in case you don't know what that is, no problem. Shooting tethered is when you're connected either by a wire, in this case, it's those orange wires that you see from tether tools or by Wi-Fi to a computer. And the images can be viewed on your computer screen within seconds of pressing the shutter button. This can also be helpful for collaborators in the studio, like makeup artists, or if you've advanced to clients, it can be helpful for them to see what you're seeing while you're shooting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in part two on the 28th. Okay. So in addition to the details, this is also where the importance of communication really kicks in. And for me, I work with the mentality that I'm responsible for setting the tone and the degree of communication that is needed at all times. So it doesn't matter to me if the concept comes from my makeup artist or from my subject, or if it's my idea, it doesn't matter. I'm the organizer. I'm the one that's got to hold that responsibility. And part of the reason that I do that is that when the image is done, it's gonna have my name on it. Think about it, the moment that I press the shutter or you press the shutter, there is an expectation that I've created an image that my team will be pleased with. And I'm sorry, gang, but I really believe this. I don't have the right after the shoot to blame my subject or my stylist or my makeup artist for a bad outcome. Bottom line, nobody held a gun to my head and made me press the shutter button. I chose to do that. So the team is assembled. We are well into planning now. And for me, every great shot begins with a great deal of prep, okay? And I want you to remember this acronym that I'm gonna give you. Great photographs require excellent preparation. And prep, also requires, we just talked about it, attention to detail. So for me, even if I worked with this particular uh, team before, and I'm sorry, I gave you that acronym and I didn't show it to you. Let me back up and give you that. My apologies, okay? Great photographs require excellent preparation. So even if I've worked with this team before, I like to get everybody together, uh, either via Zoom or a phone call and definitely an email thread Often I'll use a simple Google doc as a shared document to be able to communicate ideas back and forth. The Google doc gives me an open platform for people to collaborate where I'm encouraging everybody to have input because my goal is number one, I love ideas, even if they're bad ideas. You know, if, if you're open-minded, a bad idea can spark and inspire a great idea, but I want that input. I don't want to take any chances. So for me, my prep includes everything from uh, collaboration ideas to confirming the dates, the times, the location. Prep also includes detailing 
what does everybody get from the shoot? When do they get it? And what can they do with it after they get it? Prep includes making sure that your subject knows what clothing to bring. And if we're using theirs and, you know, or if we're, we're buying things, whatever, and knowing what clothing is coming also includes me receiving snapshots, selfies of them wearing the outfit well in advance of the shoot so that I have the ability to veto an outfit choice before it shows up in my studio. Telling your subject they're just bringing a bunch of outfits and hoping that they show up with stuff that's gonna be interesting, it's just begging for a disaster and gives you no assurance going into the shoot that you're not actually wasting your time. Being able to see my subject in the outfits in advance also lets me know how that outfit fits them. That helps me get ideas for the posture that I want to have them in in the shot. It helps me get ideas for composition for the shot all in advance. I'm not making firm decisions. I'm not taking creativity out of it. What I'm doing is I'm ensuring that I can walk into a studio having essentially created a perfect storm so that I have no pressure. I know that I'm walking in with all of the elements, all of the details that are going to allow me to be able to create and to be able to make something that's really, really awesome. So hopefully, and you're starting to see why I said that attention to detail is so important. I mean, honestly, my prep even goes so far as to tell my subject how to prepare their hair in advance of the shoot, including when should they wash it for the, for the last time? The logical thing, especially for a new model, somebody that has a model a lot, the logical thing for them to do is wake up and think, I should wash my hair so it's clean and it's pretty for my photo shoot today. Fact is, we almost always want the hair to be at least a day old. Clean hair will become frizzy and really uncontrollable as we comb it and style it throughout a shoot. Day old hair that has just a little bit of oil in it holds the style, remember, because you only need the style to hold for 15 or 20 minutes to shoot it. The day old hair will hold a style with less product and it keeps the frizz down. You see, because the more hairspray that your makeup artist has to use, the more the texture of the hair changes. And if your makeup artist is committed to using salon quality hairspray, then you have a situation where if you want to change the hairstyle to another look, it's a lot harder for them to brush that hairspray out. So in fact, one of the cheats that I use, and you can jot this one down as a tip, in my opinion, the greatest hairspray for photo shoots where you're looking to do more than one hairstyle on a model in a session is good old fashioned Aquanet. Now, I promise you any young model that you mention that to, and for that matter, a lot of makeup artists that you mention that to or hairstylists will like roll their eyes like, oh my God. But let me explain why. First of all, you can get a big can, of, and this is the stuff that was around back in the 1950s, gang. Aquanet, you get a big can of it for like under $4, number one. Number two, the reason why it works so well, it sucks. What that means is you could dump a half a can of hairspray into your model's hair and do something really crazy, take 15, 20 minutes to shoot it. It's gonna hold the style that long. And then when you're done, if you wanna change the hairstyle, it's gonna brush right out and the hair can be restyled without changing the texture of the hair and without having to fight the hair to do it, right? And by the way, you can find these tips and a whole lot more like it in my YouTube videos and also in the articles on my website. And I'll make sure I give you all those URLs when we're done tonight, okay? So other pieces of subject prep uh, including, or include, excuse me, letting them know what their fingernails need to look like. Um, generally for me, it's gonna be manicured with no color, just either a natural or a thin French tip. And believe me, there's nothing worse than setting up a shoot and then the moment comes where all of a sudden you're like, oh, it'd look really cool if I put the model's hand by her face and you have her do that and you realize like either the fingernails are like all chewed off or she's got some kind of crazy bedazzled design that clashes with your color scheme, right? And I also let them know to be fair, they don't have to run out and get an expensive manicure. Glue on fingernails work just fine as long as they take the time to apply them properly. 
And I tell them, apply them at home before you leave for the shoot. That way they're not wasting my time while I sit and watch them put fingernails on in my studio. And then as a backup, I always have a few boxes of the glue on nails in my studio just in case. So look, I could go on for like the next minutes or so just on prep and the things that I do with my subject because there's a lot of it. I can tell you this, almost everything that is on my prep list is there because at some point in my career, not having it on the prep list has ruined a shoot or caused me a problem in the middle of the shoot that I wasn't anticipating and I had to solve. The prep list that I share with the models, it's long and it's extensive and I make it a point to follow up with every new model that I haven't worked with before after I send it to them and I literally ask them to open the list and I read through it with them so that I can explain every item on the list and why it's on the list. I don't just kind of kick it over to them and say, here, make sure you follow all this. Cause you know what? Most people aren't gonna read it. And you know, you gotta understand it. Why? Why is the one question, the simplest question that photographers don't ask themselves enough. And gang, this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what genre of photography you're shooting. At the most basic level, ask yourself when you pick up a camera, why am I taking that photo? The answer helps you stay focused, no pun intended, on what has inspired you to create the shot in the first place. It also, the answer to that question, helps you pay attention to the important details in your shot, which then by default helps you to a stronger composition. If somebody does ask you to shoot a portrait for them, just a regular portrait, your first response shouldn't be yes, ever even if you're anxious to do it. Your first response should be, I can do that. Why do you need a portrait? The answer to why tells you how to compose the portrait. It tells you how to light the portrait. It also tells you how much retouching is acceptable and so much more. I mean, think about it, right? Um, a business portrait is not gonna be or shouldn't be shot the same way as one of these creative portraits or a traditional portrait that is going to be printed really big and hung in a frame above the fireplace in a living room is not going to be lit and composed the same way as a business portrait for LinkedIn is going to be done or an acting headshot for that matter. So for me, explaining why is a path to an easier, more productive photo shoot with a more trusting, and willing subject because I've taken the time to make sure they understand all of that. Now, as a little tease for you, I will share a copy of my prep document with all of you so that you can use it as a guide for setting up your own, but you'll have to attend part two of this presentation on October 28th to get the download link. So please don't message me or ask for it, you know, beforehand, be here on the 28th and I promise you I'll share the link. So I've got just a few minutes left here and then I wanna make sure that I get questions while I'm prepping my subject and communicating and collaborating with my team, I'm also on the lookout for props, wraps, various tchotchkes, anything that's gonna help dress up my creative portrait, okay? And that could be something like, you know, a shot like this, an inexpensive pair of sunglasses again, and um, it's just a kind of fuzzy wrap. And it's actually one of those winter wraps that has like gloves on the end that you can stick your hands in, but you can't tell that in the shot. Uh, it might be just taking uh, two different pieces of colored material. And in this case, I've draped the material over myself and the model, and I'm actually under the material with her shooting through the material. The collar is a $5 African collar that I got on amazon.com, right? Uh, in this case, another $1 roll of, in this case, red cellophane, some package trim from a... Um, uh, craft store that you see around her shoulders, and then a pair of red cheap costume sunglasses, as well as a red cosplay wig. So these are all pieces that are just kind of assembled to see what can we create here. Uh, in this case, a piece of white fabric that has these little kind of leaves attached to it, and a parasol as a background, as a prop. You could take a basic, simple portrait 
of an attractive young woman. And just by changing the top to something that has a little hood, you can start to make the image a little bit more creative and a little bit more interesting. Or even changing to a darker background and adding a blue gel with that same top, you can dress your shot up even more. Even in a shot like this, a little piece of material wrapped around the model's head to create the headpiece and kind of hood behind her. And then another piece of trim just wrapped around her neck and clipped. The lights that you see in the background, this is not a composite shot. The lights you see in the background are actually done with a little tiny handheld flashlight with the button being pressed to set the flashlight off done with the Olympus live composite setting. So fabric stores, dollar stores, clearance sections at stores like Walmart and Target, and of course, amazon.com. These are like the best places to find items to dress up a shot inexpensively. And here's the last tip, and then we'll take questions. When you go to these stores, especially like fabric stores and places like that, talk to the people that are there, especially if you visit regularly. Establish relationships. I have two little old ladies in my local Joann's Fabrics who look for bits of materials and odds and ends that might make a nice addition to one of my photos. They set the stuff aside in the stock room, and if I visit the store on a weekday when they're working, they run in the stock room and they excitedly bring all the pieces out that they save for me. I buy what I like, and then the next time I go back, I show them the photos on my phone that include the pieces they helped me find. So they feel like they're collaborating and they feel like they're part of my pictures. Another great option for outfit pieces, Halloween is in a few weeks. The selection's gonna be a bit light this year because of the shipping delays, but the day after Halloween, you can usually find stuff on clearance. And if you have a consignment shop in your area, introduce yourself to the owner. Keep in mind that consignment shops are small businesses that need to market themselves, but they don't have a big budget. I've worked out deals with consignment shops where I'll find a piece that I want to photograph. I pay them whatever the price is that they're asking. And then I have two weeks to photograph the piece and return it in the same condition. If I do, they refund all of my money except for five bucks for their trouble. And then I give them an image or two that they can use on their social media, provided that they tag me. It's all about the relationships. So I promised you that I would uh, give you my social media handles. Let me get you all of those. There you go, guys. There's Thank all you. the social handles. Okay. Awesome. So Joe, thank you so much. I mean, I, honestly, I think I'm out of a job at this point. I mean, you, just, <laughs> <laughs> you did such a wonderful job. It's so elaborate. You know, I was, I was sitting here on the edge of my seat, just, just listening to every single word and there was so much great information. So I hope everybody at home who's watching felt the same way. Um, if, if not, you could let me know, but I would disagree with you highly. Um, <laughs> uh, Scott, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, uh, I consider myself lucky. I have a lot of fun doing what I do. That, and, and I think that's I think that's definitely the most important is as long as you're having fun doing what you're doing, you know, yep. you're always going to have a good time and, and that comes through. So, you know, I, I definitely think you're, you're having a good time and it, it shows. So let's jump into some questions we've got over here. Uh, sure. I started off with Charles's question, and I think we were talking about this a little previously, but uh, mm -hmm. you can you can be the judge of it if you want to give out some of the, the, the secrets beforehand. Otherwise, we could just sure. say you got to tune in next time. But Charles wants to know what's yeah. your favorite brand of lights and umbrellas, et cetera. Ah, uh, so, you know, Charles, I got to give you a wishy-washy answer. So I'll tell you the brand, but I'm kind of in the middle of evolving right now, which is exciting for probably the last, what, three, four years. I, I've been a Godox user. I use uh, primarily the Godox 8200s. Um, I just don't have the need for 400, 600 watt seconds of power. I, I don't do the overpower the sun thing because that's kind of a zombie thing. Sorry, gang, but everybody's doing it, so I do it, right? Um, but more recently in the last year, I have honestly been loving taking a little step backwards while I step forwards. And what I mean is I'm shooting almost exclusively LEDs at this point. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Stella Pro lights, which, you know, I'll tell you straight gang, they're a little bit on the pricier side. What's great about the Stella Pro lights, they're self-contained with the batteries included, they're waterproof, and they're small and lightweight. The CLX 10s are basically about the same size as a Godox AD200, and they are built to last, like super solid. With the mirrorless cameras we have today and the way the technology is advancing with sensor quality and all of that, 
I really am a firm believer. It's time for photographers in general to start rethinking lighting a little bit. For a long time, we were really limited with ISO and we had to be really careful. We don't have to be as careful now. And the LED lights of many brands are getting a lot brighter. So with uh, mirrorless cameras, where you see your exposure as you're shooting it, like remember gang, EVFs, we see the finished image right there. Having lighting that's constant and essentially WYSIWYG, why not? Like to me, that's kind of a no brainer. So uh, at this point, that was a long answer, Charles, but it's primarily the Stella Pros and LEDs. Great. You know, you scared me for a second there. When you said that you're taking a step back, I thought you were going to say you're shooting with speed of Tron sticks. So. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> no desire to go back that far. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> got me a little Taking nervous. a step back. Yeah, I mean, I sadly, I'm old. So I learned back in the day when we had like those those big Smith Victor bulbs and the silver reflectors, you know? Yes. Uh, but it was. It was constant light. So you saw your shadows. You saw everything right out of the box. If you had glare and glasses. And don't get me wrong, with strobes today and digital cameras, even a DSLR, so it takes you two seconds, you you preview and you see, oh, I got a problem, you fix it. But to be able to have it all happening in real time is just amazing. And for people shooters, uh, and, and I'll stick with the studio because as far as I'm concerned with events like wedding photographers, it's a no brainer. But just for a people shooter in the studio, I still am working with that subject to create these little moments. And that means I do shoot heavy. Like one of the things I didn't talk about, but it's not uncommon for me when I do one of these shots to shoot two to 300 frames. Now, yes, I'm trying some little variations on my composition and maybe the lighting, but I'm just looking for that one expression. It's gonna be just a little something extra that really makes the shot engaging. And being able to see that stuff happening in real time, you can't beat it, so. Wonderful. So let's move on. We've got Saad joining us here and wants mm -hmm. to know a little bit about your team. We talked a little bit about the team and yep. set up. How big can your team get? How big is your team on average? And do or did you usually need assistance? Um, so I generally don't work with assistance because I generally don't have the need. I, I, I find, so let me take a step back, Saad. I think for me, the size of my team is gonna depend on a couple of things. First and foremost is what is the need? I don't like having extra people around. Uh, I never allow people to kind of sit in and watch a shoot because it's just a distraction. It's one more distraction for my subject. Remember guys, I did say that if I can, I'd rather work with somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience in front of the camera. So oftentimes the people you're seeing, it might be their first time in front of the camera. I don't want anything else that's gonna make them nervous. So everybody that's there has to be essential. So unless the shot or the job requires it, no photo assistant. As far as the rest of the team, I do prefer to find makeup artists that can do hair. Because um, remember, the hair in these kind of pictures, I'm not doing like pretty hair, I'm doing crazy hair. And oftentimes I'm just completely hiding the hair either by wrapping something around it or slicking it straight back. But um, really the key work is, is the, the makeup piece. So, on a normal scenario, I'm going to go into the studio with just three people, myself included, a model and a makeup artist, because the makeup artist that I generally work with, who you guys have seen her in a lot of my videos, uh, she uh, does hair and makeup and she's also beautiful. So she's actually also the subject of a lot of my photographs because that gives me the ability a lot of times if I'm maybe doing a YouTube video, I can have her come in and do her own hair and makeup which I normally wouldn't recommend unless you've got a really talented person that can do that. Joe, thank you so much for being with us for the last hour or so. We really appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure and my honor, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully everybody took something away. If not, if you missed something, please go ahead and rewatch it before we move on to part two, because I think there's a lot of great information to really dissect and, you know, absorb and just let sit in your, in your head and, you know, let it trickle down until you actually, you know, get it. So, We'll hopefully see you there. That's it for us today. This has been another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time.